Good morning, friends, and great to be together again with you. I trust that you're benefiting as we look at the life of Abraham and, and uh, the ups and downs of his life as God calls this man out of pagan idolatry and, and sends him on a journey uh, to a place that he doesn't even know he's going. And, and uh, Abraham has been such a great example of faith, and yet we see the warts on him and his failures. And, and uh, so he's a good guy for us to look at his life and what God did with him and what we can do as well as we seek to live a life of faith. That's been what we've been talking about, faith. And Christianity, uh, our, our whole uh, religion, our whole faith is based on a relationship with God through faith. From first to last, everything is, re revolves around faith. We're reliant on faith uh, for God to work in our life and to, uh, to move us. And we find early in the story of, of uh, Abraham uh, in Genesis 15, 6, that Abraham believed the Lord and he credited it to him as righteousness. And we find this outstanding statement that God uh, engages us on the basis of our faith and trust in Him. We're accepted by God on the basis of faith or belief. I thought I'd do something that I've done before uh, with you, maybe to help you understand uh, faith. I want to take this uh, umbrella and use it as an example. There are three components to faith uh, when we think about what is biblical faith. Uh, the first is uh, faith is knowledge. Uh, faith is not something uh, like a, a hope so, a, a uh, cross my fingers and, and uh, take a leap into, uh, in, into darkness. Uh, faith is based on knowledge, and uh, knowledge is, uh, is objective. God always tells us to put our faith in something or into something, so it's not just this feeling or this hopefulness. Now, if I use this as an example... Here's, a, uh, here's an umbrella, and uh, in the process of having faith in the umbrella, first we need to know, we need to have knowledge on the umbrella. So if you've never seen an umbrella before, and I pull this thing out, you don't have a clue what it is. So I tell you, this is an umbrella, and it's an instrument that can be used uh, in a rainstorm, and you can, uh, you can keep yourself dry with it. So you need to have that knowledge, but to go beyond the knowledge, you need to have, secondly, belief. If I told you that, but you didn't believe me, then that wouldn't help at all. So if I tell you that th this is a, 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 an umbrella and it can keep you dry in the rain, you need to decide whether you're going to believe that or not. But even if we get to that point and you say, I, I believe what you're saying about it, that it would keep me uh, dry in the rain, it still hasn't done anything for me yet. Uh, what it needs, thirdly, we need is trust. That is, not only do we know that this is uh, an umbrella, not only do we believe that it can help us, but until we actually get under it, it does nothing for us. And, and so we, we need to take that and get under it. As soon as we do, now it fulfills what it is supposed to do for us and keep us dry in the rain. That's what faith is like. We have information about Jesus Christ, who he is, how he came to earth, the perfect life he lived, that he was God in human form, that he died on a cross and was resurrected for us. We've got that information. Then we've got to decide, do we believe that that in fact is true? And if we believe it's true, it still has not affected salvation in our life. It, it, we need something else. We need trust. We need to put our full trust and confidence in what God has said and done in Jesus Christ as being sufficient for us to forgive us our sins, to bring us to a point of acceptance with God and salvation. It's like a chair. If I were to take the chair here and to, to sit down in it, um, and, and if, if I said, you know, I believe it's a chair and I believe it can hold me or I, maybe I'm not sure that it can hold me, I'm not going to sit down in the chair because I can't trust it. We need to be able to trust Jesus Christ 
that what he's done is fully and finally paid for our sins and effected in us a change. It was interesting. We had a, uh, uh, a, uh, an alpha course, and I was sharing this concept, helping the students there to understand what biblical faith is all about. At the end of the talk, a man came up to me and said, you know, I'm at number three. And what he was saying to me is, I believe that Jesus exists and died on the cross for me and rose again. Uh, I, I have that knowledge. I believe in it. But I'm not at the point of trusting yet. And then he made this incredible statement. He said, I'm hoping that sometime this year I get to number three. Well, I hope you've been to number three. I hope you have put your trust and your faith and, and uh, your hope in Jesus Christ. That's the only way. Uh, in the, uh, the Apostle Paul was engaged by a man in a, a jail cell in, in uh, Philippi. And this man said, what must I do to be saved? And Paul said to him, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. And, and so belief and faith is at the very heart of everything we do as uh, Christians in our life, how we live our life. And it's living our life to believe in God, to believe in his word, and to put into action what he tells us to do. That's living faith. And it's not a passive thing. It's not, it's not something that is, we don't have anything to do about. God uh, shows us himself and teaches us what he wants to know from himself. And, and we are to then respond to that. But that doesn't mean that uh, uh, faith is just sitting in a rocking chair and not engaging at all. While we can do nothing to earn or merit our salvation, our acceptance with God, uh, we also know this, that life of faith is actively following and obeying God. Did you hear me? The life of faith is a life that actively follows and obeys God. Uh, God's program for our life is to trust Him and follow Him in the program he has for us. Unlike Hagar, the whole episode that we found out last week about Hagar, where, where Abraham and, and uh, Sarai couldn't trust themselves to, uh, to God to do what was right and to make this happen. So they had to, by uh, their own conniving means, uh, get uh, Abraham to have a relationship with Hagar so that they could have a child that way. James would say this, recognizing all the ups and downs that uh, Abraham went through and what we go through in terms of our own lives, lives. He says this about faith in James 2 and verse 17. In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. Genuine faith is going to respond to God and it's going to be seen in how we live our life. Biblical faith is responsive, responsive to God's desires, his words, and his directives for our life. Now, God made a promise to Abraham, a promise that he would have a, a progeny, that nations would come from him. He, he had a promise that he would be blessed. He had a promise of a land that God would give him, the land of Canaan. And he had a promise that God, through him, would bless all the nations of the earth. Uh, and uh, he started this journey at 75 years of age. His wife, Sarai, 10 years younger than he. And, and they headed out at God's request, at his command, calling him to go to a place that he would show him. He ended up in Canaan. And uh, there... He began this journey with God, uh, continued journeying with God, and he lived what was a, a good a life. He lived a, a prosperous life, but some of the promises that God had made for him hadn't come to fruition. Ten years had passed, and, and nothing had happened. He didn't have any children. He thought, I need to have Ishmael, my key servant. I'll, I'll make him my heir to everything. And God says, no, it's not going to be him. It's going to be from your own body that I will do this. And that's when Hagar uh, gets involved. 
and, and it was from Abraham's own body, but it wasn't God's way. God would do something else. And now 13 years have passed, and here is the Ishmael, is this young teenage boy. And God will once again talk to Abraham. After years, God is going to enter the picture. And in, uh, in uh, chapter 17 of Genesis, in the first eight verse, verses, we find out that God will provide Abraham with a covenant renewal. He had promised him before. He had a covenant with him. But now he's going to take it another step. Now he, he has come up upon 24 years since God gave him that original promise. I don't know about you, but I think I'd be having some questions and scratching my head saying, what is God doing? I'm 99 years old now. My wife is 90 years old. How is this going to happen? And God does something wonderful, a covenant renewal, and appears to him at that time. And, and God spoke and he said, I am God Almighty. He called to Abraham. And he called to him to live a faithful and blameless life before him. To live with integrity before God. That's what God was calling from him. We saw in chapter 15 where God made the covenant with Abraham that uh, that, that covenant was made uh, unilaterally on God's part, showing his commitment to Abraham and what would happen. And now, now like 14 years have passed, and there's nothing that has happened. And, and so uh, he begins to share with him. And if you read through this chapter, you'll find that 13 times in this short chapter, we find out about uh, the covenant, the covenant, the covenant, the covenant. God made a promise and God keeps his promise. And even though his timetable and schedule wasn't what uh, Abraham would have wanted, or, or you and I for that matter, Yet God is still good for his word. And so what he says is, I'm, I'm making an everlasting covenant with you for generations to come. You're going to be the father of many nations. Uh, you'll be fruitful. Nations will come from you and kings will come from you. And uh, this covenant is an everlasting covenant. It, it will continue on. And then he, he does something very special. He gives Abram a name change. He said, you're not going to be Abram anymore. You're going to be Abraham. You're not going to be uh, an exalted father, Abram. You're going to be a father of nations to him. That's the promise that he makes for him. How, might, how many of us might have given up? How, ma how many of us would have said, this is not going to happen. I'm, I'm Look, at it's 24 years I've waited on God, and this hasn't come to fruition. But God had not forgotten his promise. And... Uh, and he is good for whatever he promises. And he promised through a covenant. He, want, he wanted Abram, Abraham to respond, to walk faithfully and to be uh, blameless before him. And so he gives him then circumcision as a sign of the covenant. Now for this, it's going to get a little weird for some of us, uh, what, uh, what God is asking him to do. I would say, you know, God, could, instead of that, could, could maybe I get an earring or something like that? But God has a program for him. And God has a command. And he says, I want you to enact this ritual in your life, this ritual of circumcision. It's going to um, be something that is going to be a sign. It's going to be a reminder to you of who you are and who I am and the covenant that we have between each other, the covenant, the pledge that I've made to you. It's a reminder of their separation from the world and from other peoples. It's a reminder that God calls them to purity, uh, to, which, uh, to which they're, they're invited, uh, and to be pure of heart. It's an initiatory rite. It brings them into the covenant community, this sign of the covenant. And it reminds them of God's promise to them that he would fulfill his word. Now, there was, uh, we can think of uh, covenant symbols uh, like the rainbow. God gave the rainbow as a symbol, as a sign that he would never again deluge the whole earth in a global flood. And, and in this case, God is, uh, is giving this sign 
to Abraham and to what will be the people of God, that they are God's people, and they would be reminded of that. They'd be reminded also of this, that the ability to procreate would only come not by their own human uh, device, but it would be something that is supernatural that God would do for them. It was performed on the male organ of reproduction, and, and, and it showed them that whatever would happen, God would do supernaturally. And so they look back, and in fact, in Hebrews, it says that uh, Abraham was as good as dead. <laughs> he, he shouldn't be procreating at this time, and certainly his wife, who has been, uh, for all these years, has never been able to uh, be, have a baby. Uh, this, is, this is past her by. And, and, and so God begins to tell him of this covenant, uh, this covenant sign that uh, this would recognize that this was humanly impossible, that God did something wonderful. There was another thing, and that was God didn't want us to just go through the motions. He didn't want us just to go through a ritual. He wanted our heart to be in it. It's interesting in Deuteronomy chapter 30 and verse 6, it says, The Lord your God will circumcise your hearts. He will take away from your hearts those things that are unpleasing to Him. He will purify you and cleanse you so that you may love Him, He says. In the Old Testament, uh, we see several places where we're told to circumcise our hearts, that is to purify our hearts, to, that, that they would be fully devoted to God. And, and so he was looking for a, not only a, a, an external ritual, he was looking for a heart attitude. And so every male was to be circumcised. Every male that was a uh, native Israelite, everyone that was a slave or born in his house or purchased as a slave, Abraham is called to have every male circumcised. And, and it was his responsibility uh, before God to keep this covenant. Then God takes Abraham off guard totally. He's going to tell her that Sarah will have a child through which the covenant will be realized. They'd, give, they'd long given up on Sarah. Uh, Sarah, that was a hopeless case. She never could have a, a child, even in her good childbearing years. And after all this time, there was no way that she would be able to um, have a child. But that's not what God says. God says that Sarah will have a child through which the covenant will be realized. God changes her name from Sarai to Sarah, princess. From her will come nobility and, 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 and kings and, and queens. Uh, God is changing her. Can you imagine as this begins to transpire for them? Can you imagine oh, Abraham, Sarai, Sarah calls uh, Abram. Hey, Abram. I mean, she'd called him that for all his life. Abram. He says, excuse me, please. It's Abraham, if you will, a father of nations. And I'm sure at some point uh, Abraham uh, just fell into a rut and he said, uh, hey, Sarai. And Sarai goes, excuse me. I am a princess. I, I, am, I am God's ordained person. And so here we have this incredible thing. When, when God said, next year at this time, you're going to have a baby, Abraham fell off his stool in laughter, in incredulity. Uh, can a, a son be born to a man a hundred years old? Can a woman who is 90, who's never had children, can she have children? There's no way. And, and God says about Ishmael, um, oh, that Ishmael would live before you. He, he loved that son. It was his son. And he felt that God would fulfill that in Ishmael. And God says, no, you don't get it. The, the child of promise, the child of the covenant will be a son you will have with Sarah, and uh, and uh, she and and he goes on to say, "I will bless Ishmael. In fact, great numbers will come from him, and he will give birth to 
12 kings, he's going to have a very prominent part. But the covenant relationship, the covenant establishment was going to happen with Isaac. In fact, he gave them the name. He said, you're going to call this child Isaac. That's Yitzhak. It means, uh, it means laughter. And I'm sure part of the laughter would have been just uh, how incredulous it was to think that they would have a child at, like that at that age. But I think also the laughter was the joy that would be brought into this household when, when the disappointment, years and years of disappointment, would come forth in, in a having their own child. Um, well, God at that point went up from them. An unbelievable miracle will transpire that an aged sterile couple will have a baby with mom at 90 years of age and dad at 100. I think I might say if uh, when, when God said to Abraham, look at, uh, you, you, need to, uh, you need to be circumcised, you and all your household, that this unbelievable miracle w gave way to a response from Abraham. Remember, uh, true faith, always trust God and to respond according to what God wants for us. So faith here is expressed in immediate and complete obedience in, in uh, Genesis 17, verses 23 to 27. I, I think that uh, I might say, if God said, I want you to do this and all of your, all of your males in your household, and there were a lot of them, uh, I, I think I would have said, well, let's, let's think about this. Lord, uh, is there some other way? Is there some other means of doing this? No, God had called for something, and now Abraham is going to obey. And here's what it says in verse 23. On that very day, immediately, Abraham was circumcised, Ishmael was circumcised, and every one of that household on that very day. I love that. The, the obedience is absolute. It's total let me ask you a question. Is that the kind of spirit in which you engage God when God says, I want this from you. I want you to be this person. I want you to act this way. I want you to respond this way. Are, are you that kind of person that would reach out and, and obey God so fully? That's what God is looking for. Genuine faith. Faith that obeys. It's interesting, in the New Testament, God has established a covenant with us. It's a new covenant. It was ratified by Jesus as he hung on the cross and shed his blood as a means of ratifying that covenant. He instructed us and, and, and uh, called for us to live in covenant loyalty to him. In baptism, we see a picture of this. We see a picture of our initiation into the people of God. Uh, we see uh, a picture uh, of reflecting uh, uh, our sinful past through baptism. When we go into the waters of baptism and, and all of that filth and corruption and sin and rebellion are left in the water and we come up cleansed, pure, and ready to follow Jesus Christ, to live in newness of life. And in the New Testament, we find this, this uh, covenant that God makes with us, this covenant uh, to be clothed with his righteousness, that we are his children, and that he, he, uh, he is our God and our Savior. He, I, the Apostle Paul says something really uh, kind of, you may not have picked up on this before, but in Colossians 2, we read this in verses 9 to 12. For in Christ, the fullness of deity lives in bodily form, and in Christ you have been brought to fullness. He is the head over every power and authority. In him you were also circumcised with a circumcision not performed by human hands. Did you know that you had been circumcised in Christ? You, uh, he, he goes on to say, uh, say this, uh, not performed by human hands, you, uh, your whole self, ruled by the flesh, 
was put off when you were circumcised by Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were raised with him, though, you, uh, though through your faith, uh, working in, of God, who raised him from the dead. He's saying that uh, for us, the, the uh, ordinance of baptism, this sacred ritual, was a way that God had of connecting with us in, uh, in a new covenant, that we're in a covenant relationship with him. And he sealed that in baptism with us. We also have another sacred ritual of communion that reminds us who we are and what our, what our Savior has done for us. It calls us to live in faithfulness and obedience. And the Apostle Paul would say in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. And so every month as we have communion, we're recommitting ourselves to that uh, uh, relationship, that covenant relationship we have with God, that he would make us his and we would be his people. And, and we would not only re remember, but we would be thankful and we would be called to live faithfully before him because that's what he's looking for. Not just faith that that talks, not just faith uh, that, that's not inactive, but a faith that shows and demonstrates that pledge of loyalty and faithfulness and our responsibility to him. Well, our faith will be demonstrated by obedience to God. If you are a follower of Jesus Christ, the, your faith will be seen, it'll be evidenced through what you do with what God calls you to. Abraham responded immediately to God. When God said, Abraham, I want you to do this, he didn't stop for a second. He immediately did what God had said. How about you? Are you following Christ in that kind of a way? Does your faith express itself in your desire to do what would be pleasing to him and to obey? Abraham did. I, I don't know, perhaps you, you have not been baptized yet. You've been a believer. Maybe you've been a believer for years and years and years. And, and perhaps you think, well, I'm, I'm a bit embarrassed to do it now. Or, or I, I just, I'm, I'm, maybe I'm afraid to or a little nervous about it. Listen, I want to encourage you to take a step in baptism. If God is prompting you about something, maybe something that's not right in your life, Maybe something that you're, you're fudging on or you're, you're, you're cheating on. Or, or, and, and God wants you to express your faith through obedience to him. See, obedience is essential. Trusting God it, it also involves obeying God. Trust and obey is the, is the good old hymn said. Faith is seen in our ready obedience to do whatever God wants. And I just want to conclude right now, uh, letting you know, here are a few things uh, where we find the, the importance and the essential nature of obedience in our life with faith. First, obedience is the essence of discipleship. When Jesus was uh, giving his uh, farewell, uh, great commission talk to his followers, he said this, go and make disciples of all nations, baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And then he says this in Matthew 28, 20, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. The essence of discipleship is obeying Jesus Christ. And what we are called to do as the church is, is help to teach you what uh, to obey everything that Christ has commanded. Uh, obedience is a proof of the lordship of Jesus in our life. How do I know that that Jesus is really Lord of my life. In Luke 6, 46, it says, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? You can't have it one way, saying uh, with a verbal profession, but it doesn't match up in your life. He, he, we've got to do what he says. It's also a key to happiness. In Luke eleven twenty eight, 28, Jesus says this, Blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and obey it. Blessed, happy, joyful, contented, fulfilled are those who, who, uh, who obey the word of God, he says. And next, it's a proof of our love for God. In John 14 and 23, Jesus said this. He said, if anyone loves me, he will obey my teaching. 
If you love Jesus, if you love God, you will obey. Uh, uh, Obedience is the essence of a strong church. The disciples who bailed on Jesus in his moment of agony and and, uh, going to the cross uh, strangely had this empowerment from God uh, to stand up to the very people who crucified Jesus and they were hauled in before the Sanhedrin. Not only were they hauled in, but they were beaten and thrown in prison. And here's what they said in Acts 5.29. Peter and the other apostles replied when they told them, you can't speak about Jesus anymore. They said this, we must obey God rather than men. Man, that's incredible. He's saying to them, "It's, it's the essence of a strong church, obeying what God wants over and above what anybody else is trying to force you to. It's also a test of our sincerity. 2 Corinthians 2.9 says, The reason I wrote this to you was to see if you would stand the test by being obedient in everything. We'll get tested in life, and, and whether we're obedient or not will show how we stand up against some of these tests. Paul says, uh, it's a test of sincerity, and last, it's a proof of our conversion. Listen to what 1 John 3, 24 says. Those who obey his commands live in him and he in them. Believers are those who Christ lives in us and we live in him. And he said, the proof of that is, the proof that we are really children of God is this. We obey his commands. Hey, uh, see, this thing about faith is not just this passive uh, hang out and just do nothing. Our faith calls us to engage and to trust God and to see obedience as a fruit of that. And I trust that you're seeing that happen in your life. And uh, if not, uh, you know that you can contact us. We would love to be able to talk with you and encourage you and help you in this journey of faith. Trust and obey for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus than to, be, to trust and obey obey. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you so much for the example of this faith uh, that that Abraham had. Father, I pray that with Abraham, as you instruct us and tell us what you want from us, our faith in you, our belief in you, our trust, our total trust in you will move us to obey and to do the things that you want us to do. And I know when we do that, you grow us in our faith. And so we pray for these things in Jesus' name. Amen.